أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين خاتم النبيين شفيع ذنوبنا وحبيب قلوبنا عبد القاسم محمد والصلاة والسلام على أهل بيت التيبين الطاهرين الذين أذحب الله عنهم الرجس وتاهرهم تطهيرا بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ربي اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أملي وأحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي أما بعد فقد قال الله في كتابه الكريم وهو أصدق القائلين يا بني أقم الصلاة وأمر بالمعروف وانحى عن المنكر صدق الله العلي العظيم It's reported that Imam Hussain سلام الله عليه explaining his reasons for his movement to Karbala he says إنما خرجت لطلب الإصلاح في أمة جدي I have left for no other reason than to seek the reform to seek, seek the betterment of my grandfather's ummah. I seek to promote the good, to call towards the good, and to prevent evil, to stop corruption. Now in the stand of, in this beautiful diamond which is Karbala, you know, often we look at Karbala and we see you know, we're bombarded with images of sorrow. And we're bombarded with images of grief. But really, it's a beautiful diamond. Okay, as you turn this diamond, light shines off it in different directions. Through these gatherings and the narrations of Karbala, we learn of truth, we learn of justice, we learn of loyalty. And each way we spin it, we see a different sparkle. Now in the stand of Hussein ibn Ali, we see that this grandson of Rasulullah shook Muslims to their core. And for those who became aware, shook humanity to their core. But not first and foremost as a lesson of how to die. No, it was a lesson of how to live. And this is what we've been arguing for. The Islam as an active, conscious process is a means, very, very simply, of pushing us towards godliness and goodliness. The picture that we see in the Qur'an and that we discussed was a very, very explicit, very, very bold statement of the God-centered nature of reality. Everything is dependent upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Everything is moving towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The call for us is to attempt to come in line with this God-centered reality. Because there is no end beyond God. There is no real identity beyond God. There is no real aim beyond godliness and goodliness. We see Islam in its doctrines, in its ethics, in its regulations, aims to push us in this direction, calling us to fulfill the divine potential within us. We see the Sharia in its general sense, in its specific sense, being there as an instrument for us to push us in this direction. We saw how these scriptural duties are intended as a means to move us to fulfill those values of Islam, to fulfill those common goals amongst humanity. And yesterday we discussed how the notion of an idealized community, as mentioned in the Quran and as epitomized in the efforts of, of Rasulullah and the Ahlul Bayt, is one where the community again is a, is a platform for promoting God-centered individuals who can move themselves and move those around them towards godliness. 
as Shias within the Muslim society and as Muslims within broader human society in pursuit of those values which we might refer to as the common good. Now, if we're looking for a concept, if we're looking for a theme within the Muslim tradition which captures you know, this um, sense of a pursuit of the common good, I think we don't need to look further than this notion of Amr bil Ma'ruf and Nahyan al Munkar. Okay, this so emphasized of obligations. All right, this um, reason which it seems Imam Hussein framed his whole movement. Okay, as we said in the tradition we've just mentioned, you know, in, which is reported in a number of sources, and it seems to be in a letter to, uh, in response to um, his half brother, um, Muhammad ibn Hanafiya, that I've left for no other reason to seek the reform of my grandfather's ummah. Now we've discussed that the scope of the grandfather's ummah is a universal one. And how is this reform intended to be achieved? Through calling to the good and preventing the evil. Okay, this social ethic of pursuing the common good. Now yes, um, many have interpreted this duty of Amr bin Ma'roof and Nahin al-Munkar as calling to the form of Islam. And you know, calling people to the practice of the form of Islam. But if we look very, very closely, and maybe it's easier in our plural context to appreciate this, we see that no, really fundamentally it's about aspiring to those common goals and those common values which Islam seeks to take us towards. And it's quite clear, we've already mentioned this a couple of times, that those around Imam Hussein were also practicing Muslims. But had they achieved the value of Islam? It doesn't seem so. Okay, ma'roof in itself, linguistically, gives us this sense of something which is commonly known to be good. Commonly understood to be good. Okay? The Quran itself, okay, uses the term, okay, wa'mur bil ma'roof, wanha anil munkar, yeah, or a group of people who call to the good and prevent the bad, before all of these formal scriptural duties of Islam were fully established. Before even Rasulullah came, the verse of the Quran which was just recited, okay, was Hazrat Luqman talking to, narrates Hazrat Luqman talking to his son. This is before the Sharia of Muhammad, saying establish prayer and call to the ma'roof, prevent corruption. Okay, so this is not talking about the form of Islam, this is talking about the values of Islam, those underlying common virtues and ethics and we've come to see that even those scriptural duties of the sharia of muhammad are seen by the theologians purely as a system of divine grace to assist us fulfill those common values and those common goods so it's about a social ethics of responsibility it seems to me, okay, that this captures this fundamental sense of Islam that a believing person, a God-centered person, should have at his core and her core a concern for those around them, a concern for wider society. Now, the, the, the fuqaha describe this, you know, Amr bil Ma'roof and Nahin and Munkar as Wajiban Akidan, to heavily emphasized obligations. And rightly so. You know, we see sometimes we think that you know the social ethic of Islam is captured in Salat al Jama'ah. This is what we hear. We say, okay, no, you can see Islam is a social social religion because of its congregational prayer, its congregational devotion. But no, I really, really feel that the strongest element of a social ethic is in this concept of Amr bil Ma'roof and Nahin al Munkar. Okay, we see the Quran repeatedly calling and emphasizing this duty. Okay, we touched on some verses yesterday which called on this duty. It says we have made you we have made you the best of communities, khayra ummatin, ukhrajatan linnas for the sake of humankind, who call to the good and prevent the evil. 
We mentioned this verse of Hazrat Luqman elsewhere. فَلْتَقُمْ مِنْكُمْ أُمَّةً يَدْعُونَ عِلَى الْخَيْرِ There should be amongst you a group who call towards khair. Again, a very, very general term, calling towards good. Okay? They call to the ma'roof and they prevent the munkar. See, repeatedly the Qur'an mentions and emphasizes this obligation. The fuqaha also refer to the example of the Prophet. As this prime model of beautiful, God-centered living, the Uswat and Hasana. And we've seen how his whole ethics of community was to create space for God-centered individuals to be a positive force for society, moving them towards those common, shared values. They refer to other riwayat, which emphasize so strongly the importance of this obligation or this duty or what I'm calling the social ethics of responsibility in Islam and I'll read one hadith attributed to Imam Riza Salamullahi Alayhi It's reported that Imam Riza was um, heard to have said لَتَأْمُرُنَّ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ It's with such emphasis لَتَأْمُرُنَّ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَلَتَنْحُنَّ عَنِ munkar And you must attempt to stop corruption it says, otherwise, the worst of you will come to rule over you. My gosh. Right? When we don't have social ethics of responsibility, we see what happens. Look, whether it's in Pakistan, whether it's in Iraq, whether it's in the flaws of the British UK system, when there's apathy to what's going on around us, the Imam is saying, the worst of you come to rule over you. And we see this throughout the world. When we don't have a social ethic of concern, of moving ourselves and those around us towards goodliness, the worst of you will come to rule over you, is what the Imam says. And he says, in such a situation, Look, the best of you will pray, will do dua, but they won't be answered. My gosh, and this is the emphasis we're getting towards a social ethic of responsibility. Look, if you're not concerned for what is going on around you, the worst will rule over you, and even the dua of the best of you will have no effect. Look, in this sense, mankind is the author of his destiny. In this sense. Okay? So the Quran emphasizes this duty of a social ethics of responsibility. The riwayat emphasize it so strongly. I've just given one example. Okay, the fuqah says, in fact, some of them say, in fact, we didn't need these scriptural evidences anyway. Because our minds would tell us that if we don't do something about social corruption, it is we who are going to suffer. All right, so they refer to all of the evidences in this case. All right, that the fuqah would rely on. The texts... The Prophet's example, the hadith of the Imam, our own common sense. To establish this fundamental ethics of responsibility amongst Muslims. But now although it's such a heavily emphasized responsibility, it's by far a simple one. Okay, It's an extremely sophisticated one. Okay, and although at one level it's about doing good indiscriminately, okay, and again emphasizing why this ma'roof is about doing towards the common good, towards the shared good, towards those, you know, helping all. I'll just mention before moving on a hadith attributed to Imam Hussein, salamullahi alayhi. It's, it's reported that somebody um, was speaking in his presence and he said that if you do ma'roof, Okay, إذا تصدي المعروف إلى من غير أهله. Okay, if you do ma'roof, using the same term we're talking about, if you do ma'roof to somebody who's not deserving of it, okay, yeah, then you've missed the objective. It was a waste. Imam Hussain says, ليس كذلك. Imam Hussain says, no, this is not the case. He says, أن السنية. He says, doing a good act, doing a favor, doing ma'roof, okay, should be like Okay, a wabil al matar. It should be like the downpouring of rain. 
okay, which affects both the virtuous person and the unvirtuous. So ma'roof is about choosing those common goods which affect everybody, all right, which are indiscriminate. See, it's moving towards godliness. It's promoting goodliness. All right, so this is an emphasized obligation. Okay, or as we're in the Fuqah's language, an emphasized obligation. We're calling it a social ethic of responsibility. The nature of the obligation for the Fuqaha is one which is kifai. Okay, so a, a common obligation upon all. Or nobody is excused, okay, unless somebody fulfills that responsibility. And we've said it's an extremely sophisticated, although heavily emphasized, it's extremely sophisticated. It's not straightforward. What are we promoting here? Are we promoting a Taliban state? See, we have to be very, very careful. All right, it really is a sensitive duty because we're not promoting a Taliban state. All right, and we see how this duty or this ethics of social responsibility, okay, was applied in such various ways through the Prophet's life and through the lives of the Aimma. And this sophistication is reflected in the conditions which the fuqaha put forth for the responsibility. So the fuqaha say, before it becomes an active obligation, you have to first and foremost understand what is good and what is bad. Okay? We can't start promoting things when we haven't got a proper understanding of what is good, what is bad, what is just, what is corrupt. Of course, the, the notion of ma'roof is something which is commonly understood to be good. Okay? So maybe it's not as difficult as it may seem. Beyond requiring a knowledge of what is good and what is bad, you know, the fuqahs say there has, to, there has to be ihtimal ta'thir. There has to be the possibility or the probability that my calling to the good will have effect. Okay, there's no point in me, you know, um, promoting something to somebody which is unlikely to work, which is unlikely to affect, such that I'm like banging my head against a brick wall. And they say before it becomes an active obligation, there has to be ahtamal ta'thir. Okay, there must be the possibility, the probability, okay, of my calling to the good of having some impact. They say that okay, the thing which I should be calling towards or preventing from, okay, is only a, becomes an obligation when that's a persistent problem in society. One off things it doesn't create this obligation. Okay, they say that the calling has to be of such that there's no harm entailed. Okay, there's la dhara. There's no harm for the one who's calling or for other people who may be involved. So the fuqah set out various conditions. And I'm just trying to give you a sense that it's a complex, sophisticated, if you like, operation. All right? Elsewhere, they discuss how there's also different levels to this duty. And this is based on a hadith. So the first and foremost level is to seek this goodness, seek the promotion of the goodness and restraint from corruption and bad through the heart. All right, simply to desire goodness for all around us. Okay, you see, the whole notion, as we said, of a God-centered individual is not a self-centered individual. All right? The God-centered individual is selfless. The God-centered individual is concerned with others. Is not concerned with themselves. So the first level is to act through the heart towards promoting the good and preventing the evil. If this is not sufficient, to move to the tongue. If this is not sufficient, sufficient to move to the, to move to action. Okay, with all its relevant limits entailed. Okay, so we're seeing that the fuqah have rightly recognized. This is a heavily emphasized obligation, fundamental to the social ethics of Islam. But it's a complex one. It's a sophisticated one. And we see that this sophistication and this complexity, you know, um, is quite apparent in the different ways the Aimma, Salamullahi Alayhim, responded to the challenges of their day. Okay, because when we look Although we see Imam Hussein as epitomizing a movement for Amr bin Ma'roof and Nail and Munkar, do we really think that Imam, Has Imam Hussein stood? It's contrasted. The two brothers are contrasted. Say that Imam Hussein is the one who stood while Imam Hassan is the one who sat. Do we really think that Imam Hassan's peace treaty wasn't also informed by concerns for the common good? Look, historians have reported 
that at the time of this um, internal divisions, okay, when the Muslim Ummah was so weak, okay, if it was subject at that point to another civil war, the Roman um, Byzantines okay, were in a position to move through the Muslim lands. Do we think Imam Hassan wasn't aware of these things? Okay, do we think that Imam Hassan wasn't aware of the risk of moving to a battle at that point, which would have jeopardized the presence of the Ahlul Bayt within the Muslim society? Jeopardizing the presence of a God-centered voice, which is a means to godliness within the core of the Muslims. Of course, he would have been aware of such things. Okay, sometimes to make a treaty, okay, to promote peace, okay, to compromise, okay, is the best means of promoting the common good. And how Imam Hassan suffered for his movements, how he suffered for this. Okay, because although Imam Hussein sallallahu alayhi could say Hayhata dhilla, you know, woe be to humiliation and indignation, Imam Hassan had to withstand, it's reported, the taunts of being called Mudhilla al Mu'mineen. You know, oh, the one who's humiliated the believers. Right? So we see this due to this social ethic of being concerned for the common good, all right, is extremely contextual and extremely sophisticated. Right? But at its fundamental level, all right, it's a desire at the very least to promote goodness and godliness to all who are around us indiscriminately. But to be very, very conscious, very, very conscious, this is not a straightforward endeavor. But we've got these divine faculties within us. We have this divine potential within us. Okay, to take up that mandate, all right, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us, and attempt to move our, ourselves and our societies towards goodliness. We have to look at ourselves. We have to look at our societies, all right, at a global level, at a local level. All right, what are we doing to promote goodness? What are we doing to promote godliness? If this is the mission of Ahlul Bayt, okay, and we are followers of the Ahlul Bayt, where are we in this picture? Or are we these self-centered individuals? Where is our Islam taking us? Now, at a time of such crisis, all right, at the local level, we were discussing yesterday, maybe internal Shia issues, internal religious issues, intra-Muslim issues, societal issues, both in our local context and in our global context. We need to look very, very hard, okay, and think very, very strategically. How can we promote goodliness? How can we move towards the common good through our institutions, through ourselves, okay? Yeah, what would be the impact of my actions? All right, is there going to be possibility of effect? All right, to think very, very hard how we can move ourselves towards being a means of developing our societies and fulfilling that divine mandate. Now, when there are so much difficulties, and you see, the task seems so daunting. We we'll say, yeah, maybe we are in this situation which Imam Rida is describing. Okay, where the worst of you have come to rule over you. Maybe not here in the UK. So, yeah, there's much things to improve. But we can... Think of many examples in other places in the world will say, no, really, the worst of us are ruling over us. Who's accountable? It's us. Okay, who's accountable? It's us. Now, in these times when crisis is so deep, all right, we can take a lead and we think, how? How do we move? It's a difficult obligation to fulfill, we've said. How do we move forward? How do we move towards this goodliness and towards these shared values? At this point, we take lesson from Hussein ibn Ali. Salawatullahi wassalamu alayhi. It's reported that he said, Allah tarawna anna al haqqa la yu'mil bih. Okay, do you not see that truth, that right is not acted upon? Wa anna al batil la yatanaha an. And falsehood, corruption, badness, 
okay, is not prevented from. There's no restraint. Okay, the good is being ignored, yet yeah, the bad is being left to run rampant. Here he says, mu'min fi Allah." says, here, the believer should turn their attention towards the meeting of God. Muhikkan, as a means of rectifying the situation. Here, the believer should focus his attention on becoming God-centered as a means of moving themselves towards godliness and through their own reform, moving their societies towards goodliness. Look, we see Hussein ibn Ali standing, epitomizing okay, this God-centered ethic of Islam, where he dedicated his personality, built his personality on a relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, as a means of moving towards godliness and goodliness, no matter what the consequences were. And for this, and in this pursuit of the common good, he paid the heaviest price. Assalamu alayka ya Aba Abdullah, wa ala al arwah allati hallat bi fina'ik, alayka minni salamullahi abada, ma baqito wa baqiya laylu wa nahar, wa la ja'ala Allahu akhir al ahdi minni li ziyaratikum. السلام على الحسين وعلى علي بن الحسين وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين الحمد لله رب العالمين We have some time for questions. Start from the sister side. From the brother's side? So, um, <coughs> you see this uh, question of uh, inviting towards good and stopping people doing wrong things. Now, <clears throat> what are the mechanisms for defining its limits, yeah? Hmm. As you can see that you could go the Taliban route if you want. Absolutely. Um, or the other way. So there has to be some mechanism to say, well, these are the limits of what you do. And what, what would you suggest are yeah. the limits? Um, well, this whole issue of Amr bin Ma'roof and Nahil and Munkar has been a highly controversial one through the history of Muslim, not just fiqhi thought, but theological thought. All right? yeah, it's on the call of Amr bin Ma'roof and Nahil and Munkar that you get the emergence of the Khawarij in the first place. Okay? Um, and yeah, the, this was a, a fundamental duty. All right? the, and, and it was a major theological discussion, not amongst fuqaha, amongst theologians. What are the limits? of Amr bin Ma'roof, what are the conditions for Amr bin Ma'roof, okay? Is it on the individual, is it upon governments, all right? Uh, okay, is some of it on the individual and some of it on the government, all right? So, for example, the early Mu'tazili position was one which said, no, Amr bin Ma'roof or Nahil and Munkar is a general obligation, okay, except for in certain issues, okay, except for, for example, on the institution of um, punishments, Okay, this is the responsibility of government. Okay, so they made such a distinction. Okay, in imami thought, in imami fiqh, you have a very, very similar distinction. Actually, they say when it comes to criminal punishments, this is the responsibility of the imam. All right, so criminal punishment is without beyond the scope of Amr bin Maruf and Nahil and Munkar upon the people. Okay, and in fact, still a, a large position in imami thought is that there can be no hudud, there can be no capital punishments in the absence of the imam. All right. Uh, the rest of the stuff is applicable with those conditions in mind, which have been mentioned by the fuqaha. All right. But what I was trying to point to, and maybe didn't emphasize enough, is I think we need to look at this duty as being beyond um, something which is about enforcement, okay, of the form of Sharia. No. Okay. It seems to me. 
Especially when you look at it, its historical context, how it's been used in the Quran before Rasulullah Sharia. Okay, how linguistically it simply means it means the common good, this ma'roof. So what's this calling to the good and preventing from the evil? It seems to me, it's about calling to the values of Islam. Okay, promoting the values of Islam. Here we have we so much this is something beautiful. This is not what the Taliban are doing. Okay, they're promoting the form. They're promoting a historical interpretation of the form of Shah. Okay, they're not, they're not apparently seeking justice. They're not apparently promoting peace. They're not apparently promoting education. They're not apparently promoting harmony. They're not promoting those values that we saw Rasulullah establishing in his first ummah of inclusiveness, of goodliness, and of godliness. So understanding this duty as being a responsibility to simply seek the betterment of society and to move society towards the values of Islam okay, s helps us to um, not get stuck in as many of these problems. But it is a sophisticated duty. Just because it's complicated it doesn't mean we should ignore it. It's also a heavily emphasized duty. Okay, so a social ethic. All right, which we have to concern, we have to have a strategic approach to it. Okay, we have to have a strategic approach to it. Okay, and fundamental is first and foremost, and this is why I was ending with these words of Imam Hussein. First and foremost is about the reform of the self, making oneself godly, making oneself God centered, and then seeking to share those values with those around. From this, this to say? Okay, Welcome, Salam. I don't know if you're aware of something that's actually been bugging me recently. The likes of like people like Ali Dawa and the like Salafi sisters. I don't know. There's lots of people on YouTube um, that like attack and scrutinise various Muslims, um, and also pe similar people like on the streets that promote Islam. And in their, their intention is to do Amr bin Ma'roof and the animal yeah. but I see it has such a detrimental effect mm -hmm. on Islam. It's actually really cringeworthy yes. to watch some of these videos. And it, like, so what is my duty to do Amr bin Ma'roof and the animal against what they're trying to do, which yeah. is the same as me? Yes. Yeah. Again, I mean, it's similar. It's an excellent question. Is this is a real, real issue? All right. And so this has been part of the um, tone underlying all of the lectures I've been giving is that we need to have a focus on the values of Islam. Okay, it's not about the brand, okay, where we started from. It seems that for many of us, okay, and understandably, okay, yet the brand has seemed to take on more importance than the function. The function of Islam is to make more godly, goodly people. So when we're calling towards, we don't need to be calling towards Islam necessarily in a non-Muslim society. We need to be calling and promoting to the values of Islam, which are shared values, very, very simply. Very, very simply. We don't need to have a Muslim label, okay, when we're feeding the poor on the streets. No, this is a duty as a Muslim. Okay, we just need to be good neighbors, because this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants of us. Okay, we just need to share that beauty of being an indiscriminate doer of good okay and then hopefully even these people who are obsessed with the form okay can start to see no this is nothing but a means all right towards goodliness um, but practically like say people on the street are like shoving leaflets in people's faces or like what can i do against that or in university yeah. or on youtube yeah, I don't think we have to. We, I don't think necessarily becoming confrontational with those people is the right answer. Yeah, I think we have to work alongside, okay, in response. Yeah, which is as I as I'm saying, promote the promote promote the values of Islam. Yeah, and this as we say, this social responsibility. If we take this as a case, is a collective responsibility, and we're all accountable for the situation. So we need to try if we if we feel this is an appropriate understanding of Islam. And it's these values which need to be spread. Okay, then we have a have a have a have a sharp responsibility to try and live in this way and to promote them. Maybe through our own activities on a university campus. Okay, maybe participating. Okay, in um, the non-Muslim organisations which are working towards these values. What better way? What better way? 
All right, there's so many wonderful institutions in this country. Okay, third sector institution in this country, okay, which are working towards the value of Islam. Okay, yet we need to, we feel we need to set up our own. Okay, now, and sometimes we do. Sometimes we do. Okay, but this is, this is a very, very good way of, I think, of trying to balance this. Please. From Okay, brilliant. Um, first of all, thank you for the lecture. It has been very insightful. Um, it's just a comment that I wanted to sure. make. Um, I think when we approach any situation, especially when there is Amr bil Maruf and Nahi an al Munkar, it is really important to approach the situation with humility mm -hmm. and modesty and respect for the other. Because um, whenever we try, there is always this assumption that we know better mm -hmm. when we approach other people and want to reform them or want to improve them or help them change. So th my main message would be that um, make sure you don't you don't do the the thing the very same thing that you are criticizing about other people, um, whatever it is, uh, in whatever situation it is. Be mindful of your own actions, of your own thoughts. Um, so there is no um, cognitive dissonance happening there. That's all. No, that's a beautiful thank comment. You. Thank, thank you very, very much. Yeah, and it sort of resonates with something we said yesterday that we need this type of epistemic humility. All right, that there's always a possibility of learning in our encounter with difference. Always the possibility of learning. And first and foremost, you know, reading these words of Imam Hussein in the manner that I read fundamentally is an effort to reform ourselves. Okay, and build that on our relationship with God. All right, build it in a firm relationship with God and godliness and seek to become a better person. Through reforming individuals is the way to reform society. So it was a beautiful comment. Thank you very, very much. Yeah? I think you said it more eloquently than I did, actually. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome, uh, thank you once again for your uh, lecture. I just had a quick question. Um, I think a couple of nights ago you touched upon um, the uh, dual aspect of uh, morality in the sense that there's the common uh, morality and there's also um, the extra morality that is gained with faith as well. Um, so uh, with regard to what you were saying today about Amr al-Ma'roof, um, can you... Um, expand a bit upon uh, what our role is in this uh, social context in, in this country, in our society uh, with regards to actually um, trying to bring others towards the faith of Islam uh, as well as common goodness whether, is, whether that is appropriate and how much uh, is that our duty today Yeah. so in terms of that relationship between the two types of duty Okay, um, it seems scriptural duties, okay, according to classical imami theologians, scriptural duties are a means towards rational universal duties. Okay, so first and foremost to get that, you know, or just to clarify, but uh, I think you're pointing to something else that I said. Yeah, so this is a talking about basic uh, morality. You know, religion can give us far more than just basic morality. Yeah, religion also offers us explanation as well as guidance. All right, explains to us, okay, how we fit into this world, where we come from, where we are going. It establishes this intimate relationship with God, yeah, and gives us the firmest handhold, if you like, as described in the Quran, okay, to aspire towards these moral attributes. So, it, if that, that's, I think, where your question was going, yeah, how, what's our responsibility in terms of calling people towards the rest of this package? Yeah, which Islam, which we believe, you know, with that appropriate epistemic community, which we believe Islam has to offer. So again, I think we have to take the lead from Rasulullah. Okay, and it's through our example. Yeah, through our example. Yeah, okay, that look, only if and when our relationship with God, our Islam is making us a holistic person, okay, and a moral person, are we in a position to invite anybody else to anything we do? 
Okay, so first and foremost through our example, and this is the way of Rasulullah. Yeah, he spent his life, okay, as a prime model yeah, of honesty and trustworthiness. Okay, and then it became apparent, and he started to explain to people that this is based on my relationship with God. Yeah, so only through our example. Only through our example. And then when people seem to say, what brings you to such a vision of reality? Okay, like Hussein's vision, where he saw everything as a means of introducing God to him. And that's the opportunity we have to share our insights about the broader reality which Islam offers us. I, I, I believe so, anyway. Sister Sadia? Assalamu alaikum. Um, you seem to use godliness and goodliness interchangeably, and arguably they are. Um, but in a UK society, what do you think would be the priority right now to promote goodliness or to promote godliness? Yeah, so um, I, I think by promoting goodliness yeah, is our means to promote godliness. All right, in a UK society, yeah, we have to look at who we, you know, like, uh, you know, as one of these conditions for Amr bil Ma'roof and Nahil al Munkar suggests, we have to look at ihtimal al Ta'thir. We have to look at the possibility and probability of effect. Okay, so yes, it seems to me that there's a huge space in British society for a God centered voice, and it's losing that. It's something which British society traditionally has had, and it's losing it. It needs this voice. Okay, but this voice, you know, is only going to be heard through speaking towards the goodly, right? So, in depending on the context we're talking about, we have to make this this shift, yeah. And uh, and actually, I think the focus has to be on the common good, has to be on the common good. And I think this is what I've been trying to point towards, yeah. And in fact, we can see that really, if we're not moving towards this type of um, indiscriminate sharing of goodness, then we have to reassess our relationship with God in the first place. Yeah. Anyone from the brother's side? Can I just um, can I just say I'm very grateful for had this opportunity to um, share my thoughts with everybody. And um, if there's some things which have I, I, I've I am not made clear or they've been misinterpreted, then I hope you'll take them in the spirit with which they were intended. And um, I pray that this is an opportunity for me and for all of us, you know, to, to become more God-centered individuals and move towards godliness. So I'm, I'm very grateful for having this opportunity. Salatullah Muhammad.